Good morning, good afternoon and good evening everybody from wherever you are joining us today and welcome to another round of our Science Culture webinar series. I'm Dr. Suze Kundu, I'm Director of Research and Community Engagement at Digital Science and today we're talking all about management in academia and leadership I think more generally as well. So for a bit of background, this has all come about as a bit of a, an exercise following the RSC's vision for a great science culture research that they did, which is all about creating a positive science culture for the benefit of science itself and for everybody taking part, because that is crucial to enabling a good community that supports quality science that is rigorous, ethical and responsible, safe and supportive, inclusive, accessible, open and collaborative, which are all things that I know that all of you aspire to do and subscribe to do, and certainly our guests today do as well. So there are five key topics that these webinars are going to cover. Back in February, we looked at whether putting your head above the parapet to try and improve science culture can hinder or help your career prospects. Today, we're going to be looking about whether academic leadership and good management go hand in hand or not, but crucially also what we might be able to do to make that even better. We have got three other webinars coming up and an appearance at Chem UK Expo. But for today's session, let's focus on this all about management and leadership. I've got four amazing panelists joining me today. I'm joined by Dr. Chris Jackson, who is Director of Sustainable Geoscience at Jacobs Solutions. Dr. Dennis Sherwood, who is the owner of Silver Bullet. Professor Radha Boya, who is the Professor of Nanoscience at the University of Manchester. We always have to have good nanochemists on here. Very happy to have you here, Radha. And Professor Steve Howell, who is the Head of the School of Chemistry at the University of Nottingham. So I'm going to come to each of our panelists and ask you one of the hardest questions because I've read your CVs and this is always the worst thing that I'm going to make you do in the whole session which is sum up your careers and your background in about 30 seconds so I'm going to come to you Chris first of all good luck <laughs> yeah thanks Luz, for that um in 30 seconds so I guess I've had a rather um a rather wandering career uh, started off in academia doing a PhD went into industry actually then after that for three years in Norway came back to get a job in industry, but couldn't find one. So I ended up in academia for 17 years. So I had no intention to work in academia and I just kind of fell into it. And eventually after 17 years, I left and went back into industry. So I've kind of moved between both of the two sectors that we're going to be considering today. That's amazing. I'm sure we're going to bring a huge amount of insight from both sides, I think, into this conversation. Thanks so much, Chris. Dennis, can I come to you next? Can you give us a 30 second intro about you and your background? Can't quite hear you, Dennis. There yep, we go. I've just remembered to turn mute myself. Anyway, uh, thank you very much, Suze. Um, great to be on the panel and to be contributing today. Um, I'm not an academic. I never have been. Um, I've always been working um, in the commercial sector, primarily as a management consulting and with a bit of banking as well. Um, I have a great interest, though, in something fundamentally important to all scientists, uh, and that's creativity and building a culture in which creativity flourishes. And I've done a lot of consulting work with uh, any number of academic institutions on that basis and written a few books about it too. That's me. Love that you casually say, that's me. Just written a book about it. That's all. No big deal. No big deal. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dennis, for joining us today. Radha, can I come to you next? Can you give us a bit of a 30 second um, lowdown on your amazing career so far? Thank you, Suze. Uh, it's amazing to be on this panel. So myself, uh, uh, Radha Boya, I'm a professor in Department of Physics, uh, University of Manchester. Um, I think all through I have been in academia only. So I haven't seen the other side, which is industry. So I've done a PhD in India, moved to uh, United States for brief uh, two years, two and a half years, and then moved to uh, Manchester about 10 years ago. So I've worked in different labs uh, across nations. And I think, um, yeah, I bring the perspective of uh, how, how it was for me to build my own lab um, 
when I started out a few years ago as an academic. Yeah. Thanks, Radha. I really, I'm very excited to hear from you, actually, because I think this sort of scene in Manchester, because it's really focused on that topic, I'm really curious to, to hear a little bit more, actually, about how this leadership has, has been included in the setup of these labs and the running of these labs as well. And come to you for a, a 30 second intro, because again, a massively prolific career. Tell us a little bit about it in 30 seconds. <coughs> okay, so hi, Sue, so thank you. So uh, the signal broke down a little bit there and I didn't quite hear you. Um, <coughs> so I am, um, I did my undergraduate degree at the same place that Rada and, and Chris were at, which is Manchester. Uh, and then I moved to Nottingham to do a PhD in 1986. And I've been here ever since. So my, my whole working career base has been at this university. And I started out as a PhD student uh, and um, I'm now head of school. And, and culture and uh, creating the right culture are, are very, very important to me. Uh, and as a head of school, I've had the chance to to, to now start quite a few new careers. And uh, over the past six years, while I've been head of school, I've appointed 22 new people, mainly new, new young academics, uh, into the University of Nottingham. So, so there's, a, there's a lot of responsibility that comes with that. And I'm, I'm always striving to try and get these things right. It's amazing. I love it. Thank you so much, all of you, for your intros. Um, so in the interest of creating and setting expectations of the culture that we would expect, I am going to run through a few things that we expect from you as our audience and our participants. Um, this is going to be a 40 minute discussion followed by about 20 minutes of audience questions. Some of those have come through on the Slido already. Please do keep them coming if you are watching live. But first, I want to just cover um, a few basic on how everybody should be contributing to this conversation. So by remaining in this event as participants, we're all agreeing to foster equal participation, not tolerate bullying, harassment or discrimination. We want to make sure we respect people's identities and experiences. We want to engage with kindness and respect, keep communication professional, consider diverse cultural backgrounds and contribute constructively because ultimately that's what we're all trying to do here now. So on that, let's move on to the topic at hand. Now, the question we're posing today is, can we, can we guarantee that somebody that has progressed in academia can also be a good manager? What are the kinds of traits that we would expect in academic management? How does that go hand in hand with leadership? So those who pursue a career in academia, you often stay for long enough and you assume a management role at an institution. But how well does the career that you've had in academia so far equip you to be a good manager? How does it help you set the scene for a great science culture? So we're going to be discussing things like management capabilities within academia, the struggles and challenges of being a manager, support and training needed, and what those in academia should be able to expect of their managers. So I'm going to kind of open this out to the floor and perhaps I'll pick on maybe one of you first of all. Radha, I'm going to start with you because you have had quite an, an academic background. What do you feel makes a good manager within academia? I think it's a um, process like basically um, uh, I'm a Royal Society University Research Fellow as well, fortunate to be on the on the fellowship. So I got uh, to you know experience training a bit. So they had uh, amazing training courses for professional development. So I had um, I, I had some, uh, you know, courses on leadership management and mentoring. So assign, I was assigned a mentors to talk to which all shaped me uh, very well dealing with my own group. Um, I think suddenly, like when you start a group, uh, you know, you have um, no idea uh, how to deal with uh, your, you know, uh, because starting a lab, you know, like you think about like securing the funding, resource management, like recruiting the members of the group, clearly setting the vision of the lab, identifying the emerging research areas but it's more about people management also so within the group so i run a group of about 15 people um, so which is 
uh, which I found it quite hard, you know, like um, uh, as uh, I was developing the group, uh, starting from my first PhD student, my first postdoc to where I've come now, it's very hard to manage team. Um, so uh, when when um, you have to set the expectations clearly, yeah, and also like uh, there's a lot of collaboration within my group members and also uh, collaboration with other teams, and so which makes it <clears throat> which makes it um, hard to set the expectations and like uh, clearly uh, envision the boundaries within my own research group. So I think those um, uh, professional trainings really help. Uh, which was not part of, uh, you know, academic position. I was on a fellowship, so I, fortunately I got these uh, trainings, which were quite helpful. Um, because when you see the leadership uh, in terms, of, in the perspective of, um, um, you know, uh, this leadership co course was from Imperial Business School, so basically from a very different perspective. Uh, so it, it also applies to scientific uh, research groups, and um, I think like. You are suddenly um, all alone when you start a research group, <laughs> so so it's a it's a process which uh, you know you have to put work into uh, to to become yeah. a good manager and mm -hmm. to add uh, uh, you know your team members' aspirations because everybody has a different aspiration. Some of my group members, when they join the group, I discuss what their future career aspirations are. Many of them don't necessarily have academic ambitions they have industry or ambitions so then we need to identify what uh, skills would be helpful for them both soft uh, soft skills as well as technical skills and whether their projects align with their future interests so i think um, um, these are all like um, you learn as you progress uh, mm -hmm. in the I think it's um, you, you made so many really good points and I want to pick up on on so many of them and I hope we will revisit them. But the aspect of valuing and understanding that need to to really develop soft skills and the impact of having the ability even to communicate, for example, with collaborators, with funders, with policymakers, all of these things are really useful traits to have, but they're not always valued. There's also, I think you picked up on this balance really of giving a researcher enough autonomy because that's the beauty of academic research to do the work you want to do and pursue the things that you are interested in that you have come up with, but also provide that guidance and that framework within which to work collaboratively as well. Steve, I wonder if I can come to you because Rath has mentioned some training. What do you think makes a good manager have you had training within your academic roles at all? And and can you reflect on some of the experiences that Radha has described? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So um, uh, actually, like Radha, I was also a, a Law Society University Research Fellow. So I had a fellowship and I benefited from, from some of the training there. Um, and just as Radha described, it, they, 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 those um, bodies do put the young fellows in some quite unusual positions. So I, I remember making a visit to UNESCO to give a talk to uh, some world leaders. And uh, I was involved in, I went out to dinner once with Stephen Hawking as well. So there was, there was all kinds of interesting things that the Royal Society put me into that gave me experiences that were really very, very valuable. Um, and not everybody gets those. So that that's one interesting aspect. Um, where we are in universities is um, I, I think that some of the, the training uh, could be better. If I compare myself with some of my peers that I was at university with, went out into big chemical companies, um, they're quite often made to go off and do leadership training uh, and it's part of their career development. Whereas in universities, it's very definitely not been the case. That's changing now. Uh, and I see that here and, and certainly at Nottingham, I've, I've seen a number of examples where where we've got very good training and leadership packages now in place. Uh, and, and the battle now is to get people to take take those opportunities, which are really, really important. And um, so so when I first became a head of school, I was I was <clears throat> I felt very um, I guess a little bit inadequate in terms of some of the things that I, I thought maybe I didn't uh, know enough about. And so I took advantage of some of those uh, leadership opportunities um, and uh, I made made a, a, around about a day a week where I could go off and do things where I could talk to people and make sure that I was getting up to speed. Uh, and that was really useful, not just from 
for learning leadership skills, but also for networking, for actually within the organization, knowing the people that I need to go to to solve a problem. And that's not something that you're going to get if you're, if you're sat in, in, in your own office, not talking to anybody. So, so networking was hugely important to me. Um, and also um, some really good things have been introduced have been uh, things like mentoring or buddying. And, and so uh, throughout the last few years, I've, I've always had the opportunity to talk to somebody right at the top of the university uh, and to, to bounce my problems off them and get the, get the experiences from them. So that's helped me in leadership and that's been really good. And I've learned a lot over the last few years. Um, but just to reinforce some of the things that Rado was saying there about, about setting up your own research group, that's, that's really not easy. Um, and, and getting started can be really quite hard work. Ensuring that your, your PhD students and postdocs feel valued and supported is, is really important. Whereas at the same time, the pressures on a young academic are, are to deliver uh, research money, to deliver high quality publications, uh, and to make sure the teaching is done very well. So part of the, the things that we have to learn is how to ensure that our colleagues feel that they can do all of these um, uh, and they can do them well and, and are supported. And that's certainly been a battle mm -hmm. uh, that I think in academia that we, we haven't yet got totally right, but I hope we're moving in the right direction. Hmm. I think, again, you make so many good points. The, the thing you were just talking about, I think a lot of it is the culture within which we work and whether we are actually putting a, a sort of level of value on these these skills really you know we have research teaching engagement and really leadership should be one of those things as well and certainly from my experience as a sort of public engagement type academic as well until and unless there is value placed on these things they're the first things to go and there's very little focus or resource put towards these things and making them good and I do think that's really interesting I also I'd love to as we develop the conversation pick up on this aspect of networking because I do think you're absolutely right that so often it is who you know but that can favor some groups over others you know there could be the opportunities to accessing those people there could be challenges around you know neurotypicality and neurodiversity some people will find that a lot easier and a lot harder there are just sort of demographic privileges really and i suppose we need to make sure that i suppose those that are good at it or that it's available to you know in your amazing fellowships for the pair of you for example how can we maybe equalize the playing field for everybody so i'm going to come to um to you next chris because i think perhaps compared to dennis who has exclusively really been within industry and business mm -hmm. you have straddled both of these camps so I'd love to hear from you as to what you think, you know, makes a good manager more generally and how we need to make sure that we continue having those skills within academia as well. Do you think that academic management has a problem compared to industry? Yeah, I think so, because I think I think often we assume because people are good scientists, they'll be good leaders or managers. Right. You can do really hard sums. Therefore, you must be able to deal with very sensitive issues affecting people's personal lives. And I think that's probably would be my comments as the biggest failing I saw in my time in academia was the way in which power could be assumed by doing well in science suddenly gave you power over a large body of people. And, and that's not they're not the same things, right? Hard problems. And so we need to give respect to the fact that dealing with people like Radar outlined and, and their individual desires and dreams and hopes and aspirations consists of a completely different set of skills that need professionalizing through mentorship schemes, through Royal Society training schemes to, to allow you to do that well. And I don't think it's as commonplace as Steve alluded to in academia as it needs to be to allow people to be good managers. I, I mean, I, I would say it because it's been used a couple of times already. We keep using this term soft skills. And I really, really, if I could leave this, this session with one thing is just and the, even the bit, the soft bit of soft skills kind of implies that it's not as hard as the technical skills. And again, it kind of speaks to this idea that, you know, writing, present, presentation skills, I don't know, like conflict management are kind of simple and all the other stuff's really hard. And it's not because all the hard stuff can't be done if you 
and marginalized because somebody can't manage you adequately. So I think we need to professionalize the practice of managing people and also um, recognizing that training has an incredibly significant role in, in getting people to do that. I said I didn't want to be an academic manager when I was in academia because I wasn't formally trained and I didn't want to harm anybody. But that's atypical, right? Because I think, you know, the career advancement in academia means that you often get more control over people. Um, so, yeah, that, and, and in an industry, I, just to conclude, I think it's quite different. There, I definitely see that people who are strongly technical need not then go into an operations and management position. They can stay and professionalize the technical aspects of their work. And people who have a desire to become operations leaders or management leaders can do so. But they are trained like, um, I think Steve said, you know, um, some of his friends who went off into the, the industry, they got that formal training and therefore that was an expectation of their role. Yeah, I, in the interest of me not saying too many words because everybody wants to hear from all of you brilliant people, I usually frame it as so-called soft skills because it also it, it is doing it such an injustice because they are such valuable skills to have. So I could not agree with you more there, Chris. Um, Dennis, how do you feel hearing about this? Because obviously you work, you know, alongside research, you know, within research, but from a, a very different angle from the non-academic side of things. Does this surprise you? And can you maybe tell us a little bit more about how really instilling good leadership skills has benefited you in, in creating a business? Uh, OK, uh, thanks. Let, let me just put one myth um, you know, straight into the dustbin. And that is that the commercial world is full of good managers and good leaders. And I can assure you that there are some really very, very poor managers very awful leaders and some really um, pernicious cultures out there outside of academia and within academia I found some really wonderful role models so let's not you know pretend that it's all good out there but I think there are some particular characteristics of academia that I've noticed in the compare and contrast um, that I'd just like to perhaps throw one particular spotlight on um, and let me refer to management rather than leadership here. I think the two are different. We may wish to you know, talk a little bit about the difference. But management is not something an individual does by themselves. Management is about an interaction with other people. And it's an asymmetric relationship. It's not evenly balanced in power. The person who is doing the managing has more power than the person being managed. Now, I think if you go into the commercial world when you leave university or whatever, you expect that to happen. The contract is, I know I'm junior, I know someone's going to be my boss and tell me what to do. Now, my experience of many, not all, academic environments is that that contract is not there. You mentioned, Sue's yourself, autonomy. Rather, you mentioned it too. A lot of people go into academia, I am sure, because they do not wish to experience that kind of thing. So if management is going to work, the person managing must be willing to accept the responsibilities of management, which is sometimes doing things they don't want to do or giving other people bad news. And at the same time, the person being managed has to accept that and not believe it is an infringement not only of their academic freedom, but of their human rights too. And I've had a lot of experience in academic circles where, in fact, someone who is perhaps um, unwilling to be in a managerial role or feels rather uncomfortable does not exert that authority over someone who makes it very clear they don't want to be managed and everything clogs up. And of course, that actually has very pernicious impact on the team. So there's something about the social contract in an academic environment, which I think starts off in a different place. That's something I perceive as an outsider. I wonder if that rings any bells with the others. Let me pause there. Thank you. Yeah, would anybody like to pick up on that um, that that sort of proposition from from Dennis there? 
How do you all feel about that in your experiences? And I also, by the way, Dennis, just while our other panelists are thinking, I think it's a really lovely thing that you did point out that there are some great things about academia that you have learned as well. And you're absolutely right. Sometimes the corporate world can be no better or has very different challenges. So does anybody want to pick up on um, on what Dennis has, has said there? Chris, I can see you unmuting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just going to make a comment on the difference between management and leadership. And it's a really important point Dennis raises there is like the managers are often doing that. Not only are there, there's that power asymmetry, which is absolutely spot on as you describe it, but they're often applying that power within a much larger framework of directives and you know managerial structures and, and very structured interactions. So it's almost a systemic, you know, there could be systemic problems at play, with the, which the manager is effectively having to kind of just work within, even if individually they feel they don't agree with some of those things. So there's, a, whereas leadership, I think has, a, I think the individual has a lot more autonomy to inspire and to do things which are less defined by an external structure. I don't know what, I don't know what Radha and Steve think, but that, that, I think that point just has really struck me. And and I'm trying to articulate what I think the difference might be. And I don't know if you've seen mm. that. So. Yeah. Very well made, uh, Chris. I think leadership and, you know, you lead by example and management, like you are set, uh, you, you are um, adhering to certain framework uh, of the, yeah, by the way, and nowadays universities also have certain, um, you know, even even in our own university, once when one uh, becomes a manager that is able to recruit, <clears throat> we have to undergo a, ma a mandatory training to be able to recruit i think um i think mainly it should be um, uh, um the, the team members uh, you know whether it is uh, individual research group or uh, you know higher a management structure so basically if you are a line manager or a manager your team members uh, should be able to feel that you are transparent and you are valuing everyone equally there's no um, difference or, you know, there's no um, favorism to one person or the other. I think this is um, this establishing this um, trust and, uh, you know, that, that your team members trust you and feel uh, valued equally um, and while respecting their, uh, you know, differences. So I think that's quite an important um, attribute which may which may make you a good leader. Um, along with a manager. Yeah, I think you make a really good point there. And I think, yes, absolutely, the, the leadership versus management thing is really important and certainly does need defining and, and separating quite carefully. I also, just picking up on what you're all saying and, you know, from personal experiences you know, from myself or things that I've witnessed within academia, I almost, and Chris, you were in a brilliant position where you felt comfortable enough to say, well, I don't think I really want to have this role. But I do think there's the expectation that to advance your career, you accept these roles and then you're stuck in this horrible situation where you have universities and the profession as a whole putting pressure on you to do certain things and achieve certain things. Whereas that's not always very well aligned with nurturing these amazing up and coming researchers, the, their motivations and their measures of success are quite different perhaps in a management position. Again, reflecting on my own experience, juggling undergraduate admissions, it's a numbers game, it's almost a business game. How is that then aligning with the responsibilities that I'm putting on my colleagues in terms of their teaching time, their tutorial time? How are they going to really nurture these students? How are they going to nurture their PhD students? And so I do think it's a horrible position to be in. And I, it's a very hard job. Being an academic is hard enough. Being a manager within academia, probably harder. So what do you feel that we can do to make things better? How can we? And I think somebody, was it Chris, you were saying, maybe we need to start to tease out these roles. You can be a management, a manager of, you know, a research group, but perhaps a leader within research. And those, those are very different roles. Do you think we should be looking at really shaking things up, a really different model of reporting within academia? Chris is nodding again. No, I, I, was just, I was just thinking, yeah, I mean, 
may, but maybe that's the, the issue, right? Like, this is what somebody described to me once on Twitter was that, you know, managers, as Dennis outlined, they kind of, you know, they, they, they do the functional bit of making it all work, whereas leaders can come in many forms at different grade levels. I think somebody explained it to me. You don't need to be the most senior person to be a leader. You can actually lead locally around a certain set of cultures or a certain set of experiments, whatever it might be, it doesn't matter. You know, you can lead at a much more local level. And that is, um, you know, that's also, that's really important. Because another thing somebody wants to explain to me is that the problem with giving people labels like leaders and managers, leaders especially, or experts, is they suck the oxygen out of the room, somebody once said to me. As soon as you put an expert in a room, everybody closes up because the, the, the person who knows more than everybody, whereas a true leader, what they do is they breathe oxygen into that room and they bring out the abilities and empower everybody. That is true leadership is actually making the whole collective fire, you know, fully, you know, rather than it being, well, okay, I just need to look clever in front of you, surfs for a while, and then, you know, you can, you can all get out of your business. But, yeah. <laughs> That's really, I really like that. I'm sure there's an analogy about a, a candle in a mirror. You know, you can be the one that glows or you can be the one that reflects light on others and, and all of that. So I think that's really great. Steve, I saw you nodding quite a lot as well there because I feel it resonated with, with your experiences as well. Would you be comfortable sharing your thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think I think um, uh, Chris and Rada have, have, have somewhat hit the nail on the head. And, and part of what I was thinking as they were speaking was that sometimes it's all about putting the right people in the right roles. So square pegs and round holes is something you want to avoid. Uh, and you said it yourself, Suze, that there are lots of challenges. So if somebody's in charge of the admissions, uh, you need a particular personality to actually be that person to, to nail down on the numbers, but to be the right kind of person to encourage students to want to come to your department in your university. And so you would choose a certain kind of individual to go into that role. Whereas uh, maybe a very different individual to be the person who looks after the exams and has to deal with all the averages and look after all the, the exam papers. And so part of what I've found as a head of school is that it's that trying to find the right people to go into the right roles. And I've also realized sometimes I don't actually know that all the time. So advertising roles internally is important. So rather than just tapping people on the shoulder and saying, well, you should do this. Um, we have advertised some of the roles that we have internally to make sure that we, we, we flesh out and understand the people who's who have interest in doing those kind of roles. And I think if somebody's really interested in doing a role, they're going to do a much better job. So that, that's something that I'd like to stress that I think is really important. It's, it's letting people have some personal choice where it's possible. And it's not always possible. We all have to accept that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Dennis, did you want to come in on this at all? Because obviously, again, you know, you pose the question and you come at it from more of an industrial perspective. But I think what's coming out here is there are so many kind of impacts on good versus bad. Let's call it management for now. Let's define it as management. Do you think it really does have an impact then on, as you said, the productivity and the retention of the best, most productive people within that organisation? Well, well, I think, you know, everyone wants my bit of the organisation to be successful, where success is different in different circumstances. Um, but I think building on what Steve and Chris have just been saying, um, horses for courses, people in right roles, and, um, you know, Oppenheimer had General Groves or Groves had Oppenheimer. So a lot of the administrative management was done by Groves and the academic leadership would have been done by Oppenheimer. And I think that the model of having project managers on major projects, um, of having, you know, professional managers doing the professional managing and administration is something that actually many outside firms, law firms, accounting firms, you know, that penny dropped about uh, 20 or so years ago, when they now have a managing partner whose job is to do that, not to run the practice. But if I could pick up on a point, both Radha and Chris, you were talking about teams. And Chris, you said um, about holes becoming great in the summer parts. Now, that's a really, really fascinating concept, because where does that surplus come from? There's five of us on the screen. We're all good. We can all do one unit of work. But what makes us collectively achieve six rather than four? That's the magic of leadership. And if I could throw in a bit of thermodynamics, there's a thermodynamic puzzle there. 
it breaks the second law of thermodynamics because most communities tend to disorder and to maintain the order of that high-performing team breaks the second law. Now, you know more chemistry than I do, but to my mind, the answer to that question is about the flow of energy through that system. So is that the real job of leaders to keep that energy flow going and going and going, to keep the entropy of the system low so that you hit that kind of magic spot where suddenly the whole does become greater than the sum of the parts? So leadership as energy injection into the community and thinking about what that means might be the way of making that magic surplus appear. I wonder. Thank you. Gosh, you touched on so much there. We've gone from, you know, the second law of thermodynamics to Oppenheimer and Groves. If you watch the other movie last year, then we're thinking weird Barbie and Gloria versus Barbie there, you know, but it is about, I think, building people up, nurturing appropriately and really, uh, and going back to actually one of the things you said quite early on, it's almost an agreed contract of how you work together and what the expectations are. Are And I do think perhaps we, again, picking up on what Chris said, you use the word formalization because this is a profession and we must be professional in being good managers and good leaders. So I, I do think, yeah, that's an amazing point to make. And um, just in the interest of time, because I think we can pick up on some of these points shortly, but I do want to come to some of the questions that we have had from the Slido um, and the audience that are watching today. So the first one is, are academics more likely to be micromanagers in non-academic workplaces because they don't always learn to work as teams or delegate well within academia? And so I suppose the kind of the hidden question here is perhaps in this person's experience, and I'd love to hear all of your experiences, and I won't share too much on mine, but my face will say it all. Are we not encouraged enough to work collaboratively and as parts of teams? And is that why we perhaps have a tendency to take that micromanagement away into other groups? What do you think? Well, I'll, I'll pop in. Thanks, Steve. I, I, sorry, I'll, I'll jump in there. I, I think actually <clears throat> that a lot of academics are actually very good at teamwork uh, and there's a lot of good practice. So. Uh, a huge amount of our, our, our research grants now are collaborative um, and um, you have to bring different people in uh, to, to, to bring different skill sets in to make things happen and you have to run a team where you can actually make things really uh, kick off in the way that Dennis was uh, uh, suggesting that you know the, the, the hold is better than, is bigger than some of the parts and I've, I've quite often seen that happen and so I, I don't agree with the with the, the tone of the question that academics are just not good at teamwork or not good at delegating but there are very definitely going to be examples of that but i actually think there's a lot of really good stuff that happens through collaboration and through teamwork in academia i think that's really interesting i think if you are if you've had quite oh, a few oh am i i shouldn't be Am I still on mute? I don't think I'm on mute. Yeah, no. Oh, sorry. It might have just dropped out of the Wi-Fi. So I think it's really interesting. I think um, there might be elements of, you know, your own personal experiences. But I do sometimes feel that maybe academia and the way that we reward success in academia is not always conducive to working together collaboratively. It can be quite an individ individualistic endeavor a lot of the time in terms of, you know, papers that you have first authored or, um, you know, ref submissions and things. And so I do wonder whether that can feed into it, but I would certainly say that the more productive groups and organizations certainly understand the value of, of collaboration. And I do hope we're moving more in that direction. And um, so I think that's a really good point to make, Steve. Thank you so much. Does anybody else want to comment on the potential for micromanagement? Ratha, did you unmute there? Uh, I think Chris wanted to say something after Chris, maybe. No, no, you go, Ratha. You go. Everyone's too polite. Ratha, then Chris. 
Okay. So I think um, uh, most of uh, my own perspective is most of my work has been collaborative. I've collaborated all through all the big papers that I have are uh, a collaborative effort. And it wouldn't be possible without the collaboration. So, but how it is seen when it is be when uh, I am being evaluated or my team members being evaluated, um, the culture is changing. I would say, like, um, uh, I think people do understand, like, when you declare your contributions, what uh, you have particularly contributed to, they do um, evaluate it quite okay. I mean, once in a while you see you are being put off because uh, it was because of the collaboration. You know, you didn't do it alone. But uh, mostly, I think now it's valued. Uh, collaboration is is well, very well valued. Uh, it's your ability to uh, work with uh, you know other groups is is very much valued in academia. I think I personally benefited from collaborations with various groups. Yeah, and sometimes like even my own team members, I see they don't want to collaborate, so they want to have their own project. So it all depends, I think, <laughs> individually. You know, some students come back and say like, oh, I want to have my own project. I don't want to collaborate. So, but sometimes the big problems, they need collaboration. Not everything can be done by one person. So, yeah, again, it is all um, mm -hmm. yeah, it's changing. Yeah. It's having that flexibility, absolutely. Chris, did you want to come in? Yeah, I was just going to make um, a couple of points. I guess the, the, Steve's point about the collaboration for papers and projects is good, but we all still are aware of all of the bun fight that goes on around author orders and and PI versus KPI, there still is, there is still a weaponization of collaboration to achieve the, the grant success versus that being truly collaborative and truly teamwork being operationally happening in the lab day to day, right? So I think, I, th I think we always have to be mindful of what that, you know, go under the hood and see what the collaboration or teamwork really looks like within the confines of any one project. So I've been, I've experienced it where very powerful people come together to win a lot of money, but then actually they don't function very well together, but it would look like it did because they all came together. So, but that's a, but maybe that's a thing for university management to keep an eye on and see what's really going on. The other thing I just wanted to say is from my own experience of having run like a large research group um, for, you know, 15 years or so, is when I went into industry, the first thing I said to my line leader is I didn't want to have line responsibility because what I wanted to do was go back to the bench, as I think you chemists might call it. You know, I wanted to go back and do the technical work. I have no interest in managing people. I have no interest in, in that. What I want to be doing is doing the calculations. I want to be doing the analysis. I want to be doing the stuff which a lot of people would call boring, quote unquote, right? Because that's what 18 year old Chris wanted to do. And through my academic journey, I found the full, you know, the full range of other things which academics have to do, which aren't the technical work, it's the leadership, the management stuff. So I do think you can go into industry, even as an academic, and actually not bring with you some of the things that you maybe had to use or saw being used around you. I think you can almost reinvent yourself when you go into industry. So there's no, I agree with Steve, there's no I think there's some really good people doing really good practice in academia and you can take that through into industry and industry, depending on where you go, will welcome it, of course, because they don't want micromanagers, of course, they want people who are technically able. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. So actually, that kind of leads to the next question and something that we touched on earlier in the conversation. So the question is, I left academia partly because my supervisor provided limited support during my PhD, which I'm really sad about. And I hope you go back and find somebody that can better support you. How can we ensure that managers have adequate training and are held to account? So Steve and Ratha, you presented from your experience some quite positive um, training that you have, have managed to undertake. Dennis, you've mentioned the, the value of that as well. What can we do to sort of equalise this playing field then, do you think? Because there seems to be some people that have access to it and some people that are completely left behind. Um, Steve, can I start with you, perhaps? Yeah, sure. So, uh, yeah, it, 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 from the question, that's that's really difficult, and and that's a horrible situation that that, that individual found themselves in. Um, I would argue that right now, getting the money to to actually support a PhD student is incredibly hard uh, financially at the moment in our sector. It's really quite difficult. Um, and so, if you if you're lucky enough to get PhD funding in, you really want that PhD to be successful. 
So actually giving support and making sure that individual flourishes and, and that their PhD gets up and running quickly and well is hugely important. So I can't imagine that any academic would not want that to happen, but clearly that does happen. So is is that a skills based gap? Is it that, that, that there's a communication gap and the, the and the academic hasn't been able to communicate with the student properly? That's something that perhaps could be addressed by more training. Um, and it's something that I think goes back a little bit to maybe what Dennis was saying, that sometimes maybe um, the academic perhaps hasn't been able to have that difficult conversation at the earliest stage to say that, well, perhaps, you know, you're not you're not doing the right things at the moment. We really need to change direction here. And and uh, I've heard that s several times whilst we've been having this call that it's having those difficult conversations, making those difficult decisions that perhaps sometimes is drilled into uh, into people in different environments in, in, in industry, for example, as opposed to academia. So I, I, that's a situation I'd really like to avoid because I think it's not good on either side for either the academic or the student. What can we do to help? And, and better training and better experiences are certainly some of the things that we should be doing. Dennis, does that reflect on, on your experience from industry then? I'd like to build on the experience in academia, actually, because I think, you know, Steve is absolutely right that, uh, you know, you want to look after the PhD students, but a lot of PhD students might be supervised by postdocs day to day. And that postdoc will have come in from wherever. And how does that postdoc know what to do? Actually, the postdoc will reflect the experience they had wherever that was. And when I've interacted with uh, academic teams, I've seen a huge variety in what the postdocs understand as being good or bad or right or wrong in this context, because they don't know what to do, because they're based on their own experience. Now, something that I have found very, very powerful, it's one of the benefits of the kind of looseness, if you like, of academia, is that in many corporates, you can't do culture change until the boss, the chief executive, wills it. Now, in an academic environment, you don't have to wait for the vice chancellor. You've got huge authority and power and autonomy locally to get it right. And one of the things that I have found enormously powerful is not formal training in the sense of you go away to a course and so on, but for a local community to be quite clear about the rights and obligations of membership. I arrive as a postdoc in your team, Steve, or your team, rather. What's expected of me? I don't know. How am I going to learn? I've just come in from goodness knows where. But if your community has got well-defined charter, for want of a better word, I have rights to do this and I have an obligation to do that, then that sets a local framework to get many of these things right. And it's not a lot of effort for a community to come together to agree what rights and obligations we locally want in my team, in my department or wherever. And it doesn't have to be the same as the adjacent team or the adjacent department. It's got to work locally for you. And that's enormously valuable in ensuring there is some coherence of that kind of mentorship, of sharing out the management roles and making sure that people know what their obligations are. Because if you want a team to work, it's not just my rights of being here, I've got some obligations too. And it's when those obligations break down that you hit all the conflict. So let's be clear about what they are. That can happen locally. And that's a powerful thing to do in an academic environment, I think. Thank you. I think it certainly is powerful. And I think we, even maybe on this call, have seen that go both ways. That localization of culture can be such a positive thing. And, and if people take on that responsibility well, it's great. But I think we've all witnessed or even, you know, sadly experienced in some of our cases, perhaps, the the influence of, you know, one perhaps negative um, manager that may not be as good. And that behavior can almost propagate to create its own little iceberg of culture. And that's that's a really challenging thing. And I think that's something we must be very conscious of, of trying to avoid within research. So I'm going to go on to the next question, which maybe touches on some of that. How do we encourage academic researchers to view developing management and leadership skills as important as they're developing their research skills? Now, we've touched on this 
maybe a little bit already, but what are your thoughts on that? Ratha, do you, do you want to come in there? Yeah, I think um, basically, um, yeah, so basically the, the, re the research groups, um, how they function is what we are talking about. So there's also department structure, you know, how the transparency is maintained because you are not only dealing, like obviously the, the point well made was like, in academia, we are autonomous. We can bring in the change from bottom up, which is quite um, a nice thing, which doesn't probably happen, as uh, Dennis mentioned, in industry. Um, however, also, uh, as a manager, you still have obligations of uh, whether it be a funding agency, you know, you have to produce some outputs or, you know, you are under the pressure to, um, you know, generate some, some outputs, right? So, again, like managing... Uh, to make sure that your um, your uh, um, you know obligations align with the aspirations of the student or postdoc is quite um, I think quite a personalized um, you know uh, individual mm -hmm. individual every individual is different everybody's career aspirations are different recognizing this and um, sort of customizing you know um, mm -hmm. customizing your um, you know whatever outputs and everything to to individualize is quite hard and people usually leave when when they say like they leave the phd they are leaving the supervisor not the phd right so so yeah. i think it's, it's partly to you know the, the the communication gaps are you know um there's not being transparent um, i think all these contribute to this so i have seen like several uh, examples of this uh, you know in other institutes and other groups um, unfortunately it does happen uh, quite often actually so um, the legacy that you leave is the people that you work with so if we recognize that um, probably it's not just papers that you are publishing you know the, the the people that you are working with is the legacy that you have and that's the most fortunate thing also in academia you get to work with the brilliant excellent people you know um, mm -hmm. I, I think valuing those um, uh, experiences of uh, managing them is, is quite an important um, attribute for academia. So how do you just sort of then um, to, to try and find maybe a couple of practical action points that we can take from this, you know, this question about how we can add value. We've seen culture changes within research. We've seen movements towards open access that have come from government mandates and, and funder expectations and things. Maybe, Chris, if I can come to you, what, what kinds of things do you think we can put in place to add value to this skill and to to maybe embrace a culture where we do better understand and perhaps better tailor different kinds of roles within academia? I just think it's super hard, you know, as soon as you start trying to mandate, let's say the, you know, management training or something, you know, or, or even if it's voluntary, as they always say, you know, the people who most need it never turn up. And, and if you mandate it, you know, people don't actively engage in it, you know, because they're hostile to it. So it's really, it's the most difficult question you've asked me. And I'm not, I'm not sure how we add value to it apart from, and I'm kind of going back to my notes here, but Steve made the point about um, horses for courses or, you know, making sure that, you know, you've got the right people in the right jobs. And that only kind of really works if all the jobs are equally as valued, right? And, and sometimes the really glamorous ones, right, in the nature papers, you know, they are valued more than the person turning up on Saturday afternoon for open days, even though monetary wise, you know, the person who's bringing students in and putting bums on seats actually has a financial impact on the bottom line. So it's how you balance that and value all those things. But that is very much something academic leadership, and it sounds like Steve's a great academic leader in this mm -hmm. respect, you know, needs to think really hard about. And that's why it's not a soft skill, is to do yeah. it well, it needs as much thought as it does to solve a hard scientific problem. So I think that's, I think it's a hard thing to solve, but I don't think it's unsolvable. I think it is absolutely a tractable problem. Mm. I'd love to pick up on that with Steve and maybe also add in um, another question, which is research groups have limited effort um, and there is a constant pressure to deliver results and to publish, you know, in this framework within which we measure success traditionally. So how do we ensure performance issues are managed with empathy? And I think this maybe goes alongside 
maybe having the right people in those right roles as well. Steve, what do you think about the the value of empathy and, and understanding the needs and challenges and that people are all on slightly different journeys? I, I think absolutely. I, I, I think that empathy is hugely important and we, we have to be able to ensure that, that our researchers are are successful and feel valued. So if you think about an individual research group, um, what, what you really want to do is, of course, you want every project to be massively successful. You, you'd like to have nature papers coming out of every project, but that doesn't happen in real life. Um, um, but, but basically, as a, as a research leader, I, I think that more of my job sometimes is to turn out people. It's people capital. People are the most important. So if every postdoc and PhD student that comes through my group gets a positive experience and learns more, that's really beneficial. So one of the things I try to do is I try to make sure that the, the, the PhD student or the postdoc has ownership of the project. So it's not as if they're being directed on a day to day basis like a robot, do this, do that and then do that, that they actually have ownership and have the chance to work with me to develop what the next steps are. And, and I think that's really important because out of that, those those newer newer researchers, younger researchers, will get a bit more of a feel for what research is actually like, and they get to take uh, some positive experience out of things. And they'll also realise that sometimes things don't work, and when things don't work, that builds resilience and it builds into uh, okay, so how can we fix this? How can we get it right? And I think the other thing we have to remember is when we're <clears throat> when we're training our postdocs and PhD students is that nowhere near all of them are ever going to be academics. There aren't that many academic roles. And so many of those students will go off into, into industry or into other environments. Or be, and, and, and that's really important that we give them the skills that they can flourish with outside. So that, that's been my approach. And I'm not suggesting it's the right approach. It's just one approach that I think can work. I think that's great. Um, we are coming to the end of our webinar and we had a couple of other questions and a comment, which I love because it's the most beautifully, gloriously academic thing, two questions and a comment. Um, we also have an amazing resource that Chris has shared as well, which is the Basin Research Group's Code of Conduct. I'm hoping that the RSC team will find a way of keeping the conversation going because there are a, a couple of really good points that have been made in the chat as well. But just to wrap up, what I'd love to do is come to each of you and maybe hear the one sort of take home you'd love to see around improving management cultures within academia and industry. Um, so I'm gonna to come to Radha, Dennis, Chris and Steve in that order. And I'd love to hear your take home thoughts on this from your experiences or what you hope to see around academic management in the future. Radha, you first. Thank you, thank you, Sus. I think I really like the last question, how do we enable academics to coach future research leaders, not just manage pairs of hands. Uh, <laughs> That resonates very well, uh, you know, with the, how the it's also power dynamics, right? The person whom you are managing, how they see you, whether they see you that, uh, you know, as like you are managing a pair of hands. Um, I think that's not the impression uh, that you want the people you are working with to be uh, left with. So in um, in academia, like in the whole career, maybe you are um, going to give degrees to several tens of students and going to work with several tens of postdocs or more. Um, I think at the end of uh, your career, this is the most uh, important contribution apart from your research papers that you are going to leave with, uh, leave uh, in academia. So that's um, mm -hmm. that's something I, I I would actively um, this I would actively you know uh, practice in my own uh, research career. Mm -hmm. um, I think it, it the change starts from like uh, you know each individual in academia. Um, so that's what I. I think we can contribute to change the research culture uh, mm -hmm. too. Yeah. Remember the bigger picture. Yeah, I really like that. Thank you, Ratha. Dennis, can I come to you next? Uh, thank you. Yes, just as a closing soundbite, um, I think, you know, take power locally. Um, don't wait for other people to do it. And if you want to make your immediate local world a better place and you're a leader, do it. Remember, it's about energy. Remember, it's about making the whole greater than the sum of the parts, and that will be different in different contexts. So get the team together, 
and work out what is that mutual network of rights and obligations. And that note that Chris has just put up is a really good starting point. So thank you, Chris. And thank you, Suze. No, thank you all for your contributions, Dennis. I think that's a really, really lovely point to make. Understand your influence and use that positively. That's really, really good. Um, Chris, can I come to you? Yeah, two points quickly. I think, you know, I genuinely believe if you empower people and you support them, the great science will come. I don't think it's the other way around. I think, you know, and I think, you know, when you're on your deathbed, who's going to come and visit you? Your ex-students, not your research papers, right? People are talking about you because you've empowered them, you've changed their lives, you've had a transformative, positive experience. Papers, maybe something comes out of it and changes a lot of lives around the world, but people are really, really central to the scientific endeavour. Um, and also, the second point is just don't assume people who are great scientists can be great managers. I've said it a couple of times. I think just that humility amongst academics and among scientists, so let's just say academics more generally, that humility that it's not easy to deal with people and cultures, I think that would take us a long way. Definitely. We're certainly, you know, this isn't academic management bashing here. This is really empathising that it's a hard job to do and to do well and really coming together as a community to work out how we can make this better for those people in those positions as well as those people that are managed by those people. Um, Steve, can I come to you then just for our final thoughts? Yeah, you put me in last there, Sue, so no pressure, and I've had some fun, fantastic comments that have come before me. Um, but I think I think what I'd like to, to suggest is that um, we all we all we're all passionate about our research. We're passionate about science. I'm I'm passionate about chemistry and and polymers and the area I work in. But I'm also passionate about my life, and for me, work-life balance is, is incredibly important. As a leader, I have to make sure that the people who work with me feel that they have chance to have a life outside of what they do. And so I try to demonstrate that. I try to reinforce that for the people who work for me. And I think that's hugely important. And I know that strays into a, an upcoming uh, show that you're going to have about work-life balance. But to me, it's really, really important. Brilliant. I love that. Thank you so much, Stephen. What a perfect place to end. But this isn't the end of the conversation. It's very much just the beginning. It's a bit of a provocation for our community because we want to hear everybody's experiences and everybody's suggestions as to how we can all work together to make this better for the sake of a more positive science culture generally and to be more impactful on society. So that just brings me to the end. Say thank you to Dr. Chris Jackson, to Dr. Dennis Sherwood, to Professor Radha Boy and to Professor Steve Howdell for being our amazing panellists today, to Jim, Lizzie, Heron and Lewis and everyone at the RSC for making this happen and of course to our awesome audience as well. Thank you so much for joining us. We have one of these every month for the next four months so please do tune in, catch up on the old discussion that we had back in February as well and if you'd like to get involved in the questions make sure that you put your questions in early on using the Slido for each of the upcoming webinars. Thank you all so much and have a great rest of your day wherever you are.